بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين لا سيما بقية الله في الأرضين أجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف اللهم أخرجني من ظلمات الفه وأكرمني بنور الفه اللهم افتح علينا أبواب رحمتك وانشر علينا خزائن علومك برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين الحمد لله بها في توفيق to continue our study of معارف القرآن by late Ayatollah Masbah Last week we talked about two, ses- two topics in the one session One was about inclusiveness of Allah's power for everything and we said when we say everything it means every possible thing so if someone says does his power belong to the impossible we said if it is muhala adi means it's ordinarily thought to be not possible but it is still logically philosophically possible yes like jazat but if it is something essentially impossible or it's existentially its occurrence is impossible then we said these two things have problems in themselves so Allah's power has no limit, but these are not things which can be done. Like, if we say to a mathematician, are you able to make 2 plus 2, 5? If he says, I cannot do this, it doesn't mean that he has problem. It means that this is not doable. The next issue that we talked was about Allah's power and will with respect to qabi, those things which are immoral. We said his power belongs to them because power always belongs to both sides. Power cannot belong only to one side. We said if, for example, someone is just falling from the roof, we don't say he has power for falling because he has not power for stopping. So he has no power for falling. So he has power for those things which are moral and immoral. But his irada, his will, would not belong to the things which are immoral. So this is about our previous discussion. Now we want to discuss another idea which is closely connected to the previous discussion. And this is about uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being questioned about his actions. Is it possible to question him or not? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran says, لا يسأل عما يفعل وهم يسألون Allah is not questioned about what he does and they are questioned means people are questioned when we do something then we have to be answerable why we have done this even for good things and bad things we both we have to have answer But Allah is not questioned. People who are like Ash'arites, who don't believe in Husnuqob, Fzati and Husnuqob Aqli, they say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not bound to obey or observe any moral values or standards because there are no such things in reality. Whatever he says to be 
done is good whatever he says it is good it is good whatever he does is good so al hasanu ma hasanahu ash-shar al hasanu ma fa'alahu ash-shar al hasanu ma amara bihi ash-shar everything takes its validity from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so for them la yus'alu amma yaf'al wa hum yus'alun is taken to mean that he doesn't observe any moral values or standards and he can do whatever he wants and no one can you know question that ayatullah misbah says in order to understand this ayah better we have to know that in arabic there are three types of sual la yus'alu amma yaf'al wa hum yus'alun comes from the root sa'ala ya sual sa'ala yas'alu la yus'al is muzari' majhul in arabic sual sometimes it is a matter of asking for something to be given ya for example Uh, those who are beggars or those who ask for help they may be called sa'il amma al-yatima fala taqhar wa amma as-sa'ila fala tanhar so this sa'il is someone who asking for ata for gift for uh, you know some present to be granted this is istata talabul ata sometimes sual is a matter of istilam you inquire is istifham istilam istifham istifsar you ask for interpretation this is more a matter of inquiring about something sometimes sual means to question in the sense of bringing someone to a process of questioning and holding him accountable for what he has done or what he has said or what judgment he has made so it's a kind of Uh, demand for answer demand for justifications why you have done this or why you have not done this why you said this or why you have not said this not in the sense of just inquiring because inquiring can be from top to the bottom from bottom to the top or people who are equal we may ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the sake of understanding there is no problem angels ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for example ataj'alu fiha man yufsidu fiha wa yasfiku ad-dima wa nahnu nusabbihu bi hamdika wa nuqaddisu lak there are questions that are asked and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers sual in the sense of istata is also not only not a problem it's actually very common in our duas in our supplications we many times ask allah so la yusal cannot be istata because it's that's not a problem plus istata if sual is used in the sense of asking for be uh, for something to be given is not used with an and we say sa'ala an ash-shay or an hu it can be inquiring or it can be bringing someone uh, and holding someone responsible and accountable about something like we said last week you know kullukum ra' wa kullukum mas'ulun an ra'iyyat so was'alu Allah min fadli surah an-nisa verse 32 is an example for istata That's not a problem. 
اَتَجْعَلُ فِيهَا مَنْ يُفْسِدُ فِيهَا وَيَسْفِكُ الدِّمَا Surah Baqarah 30 is an example for inquiring. That is not also a problem. But to bring Allah to kind of like a court and you know you question him and ask him for justification, that's the problem. Why? Why su'al in the third sense cannot be addressed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Some people have thought that Allah is so great that when we poor, needy, humble beings think of his greatness, we would not dare asking him for answer. So it's a matter of us being very poor and needy and him being very great and generous. Therefore, we cannot ask him for you know, answer or, or explanation in this way. Ayatollah Misbah Rahmatullah says, It seems that the ayah la yus'alu amma yaf'al wa hum yus'alun is not about this point. Because maybe there are people who have that acknowledgement of greatness of Allah and their absolute need. But there are many people, Ayatollah Misbah says, like us, like many of us, he says, like many of us, that we don't understand that much greatness of Allah so that we don't dare asking him questions. We would be afraid of asking questions for the sake of, you know, in the sense of demanding justification. So this is not a very adequate explanation. Some people have said the, re the reason that Allah is not questioned is because everything he does is based on hikmah, on justice, uh, sorry, on wisdom. Not only justice, but also wisdom. If someone observes justice and on uh, top of that wisdom, then we don't ask them for questions because we are sure that there is a wisdom behind every action, every decision. So, this is one point. But Ayatollah Mesbah says, although this point is by itself acceptable, is right, that Allah is wise and He never does anything, you know, in vain or anything, you know, unwise. But Ayah seems to be about something else. Ayah seems to be not about whether he has hikmah or not. It seems it to be about that no one has right of questioning him, right of bringing him to the, you know, process of accountability. Another thing is that some people have said, La yus'alu amma yaf'aluhum yus'alun. It's a matter of rights. Human beings have mutual rights, more or less. I'm not saying it's equal. Father, mother have some rights over children. Children have some rights over parents. Teachers have some rights over students. Students have some rights over teachers. Anyway, when we benefit and benefit from each other, then rights are taking form. But with respect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, no one has any right over Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because everything that creatures have comes from Him. So no one can say, I have rights over Allah, therefore I can bring Him to process of questioning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us everything that we have, so we don't have any rights over Him. This is also one idea. But if this meaning is correct, again, 
maybe there is an issue that then it would not explain about Allah doing something immoral or not doing immoral things. Because when we say no one has any right over Allah, then it means that the focus of answer is taken away from the issue of whether Allah can do immoral things or not. Another explanation, and Ayatollah Mesbah leans towards this one, is to say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his essence is absolutely perfect, absolutely benevolent and generous and kind and merciful and loving. Therefore, whatever he does is based on the best interest of everyone. Yes, we have to consider the whole thing. When I say everyone, not just one person. Because if it is just one person, then maybe interest of one person is in conflict with interests of majority of people. But if we consider all creatures and the best maslaha for the greatest number of creatures, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would out of his wisdom and out of his uh, kindness consider that the greatest maslaha for larger number of creatures. And this is Nizam Ahsan, this is the system of the best possible creation, the best interest of creatures being met. So when we say Allah doesn't do kabi, doesn't do immoral things, it doesn't mean that from outside there are factors, there are things that would limit him. Or that Allah has no power to do kabi. It means that Allah has in his essence qualities that would conflict with doing kabi. No pressure from outside. No weakness from inside. It's just a matter of an, uh, having an essence which is very pure and very uh, rich that would not be pushing or letting bad things to happen. Then he refers to an idea of the Tafsir of Al-Manar. In the book Tafsir of Al-Manar, it has been said that since no one has any rights over Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and therefore la yus'alu amma yaf'al, it is wrong to Pray to God and then say, please grant me this Bahaqqa Muhammadan wa ala Muhammad, for example. Or Bahaqqa Adam wa Musa wa Isa, for example. Or Bahaqqa Anbiya'ika wa al-Mursaleen, mathalat. They say, no one has any rights over God. How can then you ask him to grant you your hajat because of rights of the Prophet or Ahlul Bayt or previous Prophets, etc.? No one has any rights over Allah. What does it mean, Bahaq Muhammad and Wa'al Muhammad, for example? Ayatollah Mesbah says there are two ways to answer to this question and clarify the mistake that uh, has been done in Al-Manar. Al -Manar. First, we give you a brief answer and then a more detailed and substantial answer. It is true that no one has rights over Allah, but the problem is that in Al-Manar it has been thought that 
because no one has by himself or herself any right over Allah it means that no one has absolutely any right over Allah even if Allah has granted them some rights this is wrong so we don't have any rights over Allah to begin with but maybe Allah then grants us some rights over himself for example if he promises and says I'm going to give you if he doesn't give there's a problem because by promising he has made a right he has undertaken some responsibility so to begin with or you can say originally initially yes no one has any rights over Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but we know that sometimes Allah himself defines some tasks and then based on that defines also some rights for those who undertake that task or for example he says وَكَانَ حَقَّنَ عَلَيْنَا نَصْرُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ to help the believers is a right over us or is an obligation upon us so this is the right that he has given to mu'minin to help them they have right for help or kataba ala nafsihir rahma he has made mercy compulsory for himself means creatures can expect mercy coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or in Allah hashtara min al mu'mineen anfusahum wa amwalahum bi'anna lahum al jannah till it reaches wa'dan alayhi haqqa this is one of those promises of Allah that he says he has purchased from believers their lives and their money so that they can go to heaven but this is a true promise so if he has said that instead of your mal your money and your nafs your soul instead of that I give you certain reward I give you access to heaven this becomes then necessary if he undertakes this if he promises this then it becomes necessary in the Quran in Surah Shu'ara we have in several places in ajriya illa ala rabbil alameen my reward is not except upon the Lord of the worlds of universes so this is also a kind of undertaking a kind of uh, task that Allah has for himself and observes that وَمَنْ يَخْرُجْ مِنْ بَيْتِهِ مُحَاجِرًا إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ ثُمَّ يُدْرِكُهُ الْمَوْتِ فَقَدْ وَقَعَجُهُ عَلَى اللَّهِ About hijrah and jihad also in Surah Nisa verse 109 Allah says that their reward would be only upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah has undertaken ala Allah. Means he has made it compulsory for himself. Uh, there is a ayah uh, that says that um, for the people who repent, it is upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive them. Uh, it's not mentioned here, but uh, it's very similar to Kataba Allah Nafs Nafs Kataba Rabbukum Allah Nafs Her Rahma. Let me. Uh, uh, the ayah is this: Inna Matuwa to Allah Allah Lilladina Yamaduna Sayyad. I find the reference for you. If uh, 
Yeah, I don't know why this search doesn't work. You can easily find it. إِنَّمَا التَّوْبَةُ عَلَى اللَّهِ لِلَّذِينَ يَعْمَلُونَ سوء or سيئات بالجهال. I don't know. I think it's سوء بالجهالة. ثم يتوبون من قريب. توبة على الله. Because you know, توبة is an action of Allah and an action of the person who repents. Taba Allahu alayhim liyatubu. Actually, Allah does Tawbah twice, return twice. First, He returns to us and offers us Tawbah, prepares us for Tawbah, and second, He accepts our Tawbah. So, إِنَّمَا التَّوْبَةُ عَلَى اللَّهِ لِلَّذِينَ يَعْمَدُونَ سُوءَ بِجَهَالَةٍ ثُمَّ يَتُوبُونَ مِنْ قَرِيبٍ فَأُولَئِكَ يَتُوبُ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِمْ وَكَانَ اللَّهُ عَلِيمًا حَكِيمًا سورة النساء verse 17 thank you and sometimes Allah does the opposite so he here he is promising he is promising reward he is promising toba etc sometimes can be the other way if maslaha wisdom requires for example in dua kumal we say aqsamta an tamla'aha min al kafirin so maslaha requires that there would be some punishment Allah is very forgiving and very much merciful. Therefore, Imam Ali in Dua Kumil says to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Lawla aqsamta min ta'adheef abil yaqeena aqta'u lawla ma aqsamta bihi min ta'adheef jahidik wa ikhlaad mu'anadik la ja'alta al-nara kullaha bardan wa salama. وَلَكِنَّكَ تَقَدَّسَدْ أَسْمَاءُكَ أَخْسَمْتَ أَنْ تَمْلَاهَا مِنَ الْكَافِرِينَ مِنَ الْجَنَّةِ وَالنَّاسِ أَجْمَعِينَ So this is also opposite to promise of reward. This is a kind of threat, a kind of va'id for maslaha. So why he does give promises, why he sometimes threatens all, it's because of maslaha, because of uh, you know wisdom that he has it's not arbitrary or it's not because he's emotional he's you know happy or he's you know angry therefore he decides to punish or reward no all go back to the qualities that he has in his essence he's such a perfect being that he supports and he encourages and he rewards good things and in discourages us about bad things so Ayatollah Mesba says we can say after all this uh, discussion that the ayah la yus'alu ma yaf'al wa hum yus'alun means that divine essence requires and implies that only good things, beautiful things would be done by him. His action must match his essence, his attributes. The similarity or the relation between divine attributes and actions is something that 
is mentioned and understandable from the Quran and Sunnah and also from intellectual arguments because actions cannot happen unless there is a matching essence and quality. It's not that actions happen by chance from a kind of essence like Allah only good can come out then Ayatollah Mesba enters into a discussion which is very much developed by Allama Tabatabai you know the story of I'tibariyat in the works of Allama Tabatabai Rahmatullah alayhi. He has a risala about etabariyat. He has discussion about etabariyat in usul of al Alis. He has discussion about etabariyat in risala to al-wilaya, which is uh, one of the best books by Allah Metabatabai, where he talks about the position of wilaya as nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, etc. So basically the idea is this about etabariyat but you have to be careful that etabariyat can be used in other senses as well Ayatollah Mesbah in usul sorry in Amuzash falsafa explains different meaning of meanings of etabariyat what here we mean is this that sometimes we are talking about facts and realities Sometimes we talk and study and deal with the things that have been supposed, have been assumed, but they may not have any uh, trace of reality directly. For example, please listen carefully to this example that I'm mentioning. Uh, it's not in the book. You know, if I have a pen in my hand and I give this pen to you and now it is in your hand, what has actually happened, what is a reality, is that the pen is no longer in my hand and it is in your hand, just this. But If I own the pen and then I sell it to you and you then own the pen. Ownership is not a real change. Whether pen is in my hand or your hand is a reality. But it can be in your hand as a mana, it can be in your hand as gift, it can be in your hand as something that you have purchased. So there are different rulings that may apply to this reality that something is in your hand. So in especially social life, social relations, we have many notions that are not purely based on facts and realities. They are more based on our assumptions, our contracts. Ownership, Melkiya, Zawjiya. These are Ertebari. When two people marry, and we say, now this is husband, this is wife. Zawjiya by itself is not something existential. It's based on contract. It's based on agreement, on assumption. And maybe sometimes different traditions have different ways of arranging marriage, etc. Even we may have you know, different fatwas about details. 
But after that, there are lots of real consequences. For example, now that they are married or now that someone owns something legally, there can be lots of consequences. He has a right to use what he owns. Or he can, you know, for example, look at, you know, his wife or wife can look at the husband in the way that you cannot look at a non-mahram or a stranger. So real changes, real uh, rulings, consequences can come. I own this house, I live here, I keep myself safe, warm, etc. These are real. But ownership is etabari, is based on our contracts, our assumptions. Allah Metabatabai in Rasalatul Wilaya says that many things which are mentioned about heaven and hell or in religion in general can be a'tabari. They relate to realities but they don't directly inform us about some realities. One example that Ayatollah Mesbah here very much, uh, you know, develops and uh, highlights is buying of money and soul by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For example, Allah says in Surah Tawbah verse 111, إِنَّ اللَّهَ اشْتَرَى مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Allah buys from mu'minin. What does he buy? Amwalahum wa anfusahum. Ba'anna lahumul jannah. The price is jannah. But do you think really there is a purchase that Allah buys and you know gives the price? Like we do in the shops, for example, or market. Or Allah says, Hal adullukum, Surah Saf, verse 10, Hal adullukum ala tijaratan tunjikum min azabin alim? Shall I show you, shall I inform you, shall I guide you towards a business, a trade that would save you from painful punishment? So is there really a tijara? Or Allah is using this language to explain to us a fact. And that is what, through your actions, through your iman, through your qualities, you can gain. It's not like, for example, if you study and learn, is this learning is a natural outcome of studying. It's not a kind of that you are buying knowledge. But we can use this language of buying and you know purchasing. I tell Allah says once I asked you know someone you know, one Sufi order, a person from a Sufi order, that they would you know take bay'ah from people, people pay allegiance to them, to their mori the murad, to their murshid. And he said the reason we ask for bay'ah is because Allah has done a kind of business. Allah has purchased from them. So there is a selling and buying. But Allah himself has not done this bay'ah and holding hands and doing, you know, qabd. Uh, so on behalf of Allah, we do bay'ah, which is to implement or to execute the bay'ah. But Ayatollah Mesbah says, no, this, uh, these people have taken uh, shtara literally as if there is really an act of buying and selling. No, it's not really buying and selling. 
it's for our understanding. Like we say, dunya Is it that dunya is really a farm? Or tahsuduna ma tazra'un, you will harvest what you have planted. Is this really a harvest? No. So, alhamdulillah, this discussion finishes. Now it is clear that when we say, La yus'alu amma yaf'al wa hum yus'alun, it means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so uh, wise, so perfect, that his essence would not match doing anything bad, anything immoral. He only wills good things. And actually, uh, I you know always add to this discussion that it's not only Allah who is not la yus'al, even angels. Angels also, because they always do good, they are not questioned. On the Day of Judgment also, angels are not going to be brought for, uh, you know, questioning. Because angels also do only good things. So it's not that Allah, because has created us, na'uzu billahi, doesn't allow us to observe, you know, justice or, you know, to bring him into questioning. No, it's because he only desires good things and any being, even angels who are creatures of Allah, if they only desire good things and only do good things, then there is no point in questioning them in the sense of asking for justification and judging them. And then we have this discussion about etabariyat, that we have to be careful that what is explained in this language is not necessarily exactly the real change that happens in the world. The next topic is about aims of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his actions. Does Allah have any aim, any purpose, and if so, what is his aim or what are his aims? This is what we discussed in Baba Hadi Ash, this is what we discussed in Kashful Murad. In several places we have discussed this. Some people have thought that if we say his actions have aim, have purpose, he becomes needy and subordinate because it means that he needs the result of his action. But the answer is that sometimes the agent has an aim, but the aim is to benefit others, not to benefit himself. We shouldn't think that any fa'il only wants to benefit from others or from action to meet his one of his needs or some of his needs. I say Allah also is then needy. No, it's not like that. In order to clarify what is the right position in this discussion, he makes some points. I mentioned some of these points today, and then inshallah we continue in the next session. You are familiar with four types of causes. In Sharh Manzuma, actually, we had this recently. We have illat maddi, illat suri, illat fa'idi, illat ghai. The material cause, the formal cause, the agent, and ghaya, the end. If a carpenter makes a chair in order to sell it or in order to rest, so Gaya, the end, the purpose is making money or having a place for rest. Again, in philosophy, we have explained that illa tegai is before the action, is illa, and actually is motivating the agent. So, illa is actually 
causing illat fa'ili because illat fa'ili when the fa'il is belqast when fa'il does things intentionally cannot do anything unless there is a purpose so illat ghai is illa for illat fa'ili is the cause for the cause but actual rest or actual money that this carpenter is going to make comes later as ma'lul of this action so my thinking my imagination my consideration of purpose is before action and makes me decide to do that action but the actual benefit comes later yeah unless you have the share you cannot benefit from it so qaya is ma'lul although illa tagai is illa another thing is that sometimes we want something but it has some prerequisites some muqaddimat so you have to also bring them for example you want to go to hajj but you know that you cannot perform hajj without registration without paying you know some money without buying a ticket without buying a haram dress of a haram etc so sometimes our aim belongs to the prerequisites or grants necessity to the prerequisites prerequisites from this we can understand that there can be a hierarchy of the aims why you took ticket you say i took ticket because i want to travel to mecca or to jeddah why you want to travel to mecca or jeddah because i want to be in the place of ihram in the time of you know for example zil hajja why 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 and then you at the end say because you want to be nearer to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so there can be a hierarchy of the aims then he says when we look at our actions we consider reflect on our actions and their aims and ends we would realize that every rational every wise action is to help us meet some of our needs to acquire something to obtain something or at least to protect ourselves against some harms but if we look more closely we find that sometimes the end is not to meet our need it can be to meet someone else's need sometimes i uh, buy food so that i eat sometimes i may buy food so that someone else eats sometimes people may even give their lives in order to protect their nation so it's possible that we would have the kind of uh, action that we directly don't benefit from or at least that is not our intention even if we are going to benefit from it somehow maybe that was not our purpose in a moral philosophy classes i normally discuss this issue of hubbudzat self love and i don't want to discuss it now inshallah if we have falsafi akhlaq we can talk that uh, many thinkers many philosophers they say that uh, everything that human beings do is out of hubb thought they do everything because of hubb thought but uh, i personally believe that maybe most of our actions are for hubb thought but we can also have genuine independent uh, motives things which are different from hubb thought uh, ayatullah misbah has this opinion 
that many things or all things go back to hope of that. Even, for example, a soldier who is going to fight and maybe giving his life, again, there is hope for that. Because he thinks that, for example, if I give my life for my country, I would have more satisfaction or I would have more peace of mind or I would be respected and honored by my people more, etc. So again, there is some element of, you know, self-centeredness. He says, one conclusion up to here is that in our actions, the aim, the target, because aim is the target when you, sh you know, shoot some arrow, for example, towards something to be on, fix on the wall, etc. That target is called hadaf. So, in our actions, the aim is normally what we gain. I say normally, he, he, he seems to mean uh, always. What we gain. But in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is it the same? No. Because he doesn't gain anything. For him, the purpose can be to give. Man nakardam khalq ta ke sudi konam. Balke ta barbandegan judi konam. I haven't created people in order to benefit from. I have created them in order to show my generosity. So his actions have aim. Otherwise would not be Hakim. Hakim does things with purpose, with aim. But although he has aim or aims, and there is actually sometimes hierarchy of the aims, but it's not for helping himself, for benefiting himself. Purpose is there, but not benefiting from it for himself. Then there is a discussion about the fact that from a philosophical point of view, everything needs some end, some purpose. Uh, even the things that we may uh, call them uh, abbas, things that we may consider to be in vain, there is a purpose, there is an aim, and in Allah's actions are always aims. So we can, inshallah, continue this discussion. And after clarifying more the concept of aim, we can say then what is the aim or what is the series of the aims what is the hierarchy of the aims that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has in his creation? Interestingly, in our discussion about commentary on Manzume, about two sessions ago, we discussed all these things about when, for example, you meet two people, you know, two people meet each other after some years by chance. We call it chance, but for philosophers, this is not chance. When someone is playing with his beard, some people may think there is no purpose. Again, philosophers say there is purpose. If an ill person is turning around on the bed, we may think there is no aim because this side or that side is not different, but there is aim and purpose. So for everything that uh, Fa'il, an agent, who has will does, there is aim, or at least there is one aim, maybe there are more than one aims, and then shall we see what are the aims of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alam.